who is ready for some Poison Regressions. I am. I hope you are too. Okay, so Poison Regressions can be really, really scary, but they're also really fun. Um, so hopefully I can alleviate some stress or tension that you may have going into um, doing a Poison Regression. Okay, so to start, as always, you set your working directory. I actually click on the choose directory. There we go. Okay, so then you can just go to whatever um, folder contains all the files that you're working with for this, um, for your poison regression. So next thing you notice is that we have something that a little different than what we're usually working with. Usually we have a read CSV. Um, the data that we're working with actually came from R and it was sent as a text file. So in order to read a text file, it's very doable in R Studio. you just do read tables. That's what we're going to do here. Um, and then because in a text file you don't those headers don't come through or you, you don't have them labeled, so we're going to label them manually using the, the C bind and the column names function. Alrighty. Actually, I don't want the observations. Okay, so some background on um, this data set. So the CRAB data set um, comes from this study that was investigating factors that affected whether um, a female crab had any other males residing near her. And these males are also called satellites. So uh, predictor variables that were thought to affect this um, included female crab color, which was C, spine condition, or S, weight, and carapace width, or W. And the response variable for each female crab um, was the number of satellites, or SA. So for us, we're interested in knowing, one, how does the number of satellites or male crabs residing near a female crab, um, how does that change depending on the width of her back or carapace width? And two, what is the rate of satellites per unit width? So I don't know what your background is exactly um, with Poisson regression. So whether you're a novice at this or uh, Pro status. I'm going to give you a quick background. Um, if anything, it's going to fire up those little gray cells for you. So in poison regression, the response variable is count. Or you can have rate or incidence um, serve as your response variable. And um, when you have incidence, that's y over t. So if your response variable is rate, t serves as some interval that's representative of some type of grouping. Um, such as time or space. Now, if your variables, um, sorry, if, if your predictor variables are all continuous, or if you have a combination of continuous and predictor and categorical predictors, then you're in the realm of poison regression. This holds true also if your variable of interest or your response variable um, is rate or incidence. On the other hand, if you have all categorical predictors, then you're more in the realm of completing a log linear model. And that's because counts are modeled in contingency tables. Um, so with all of statistical analyses, you have some underlying assumptions. And for Poisson regression, there's there's several, but the, the main one is the so-called response, uh, sorry, random component. And that's essentially that your response variable has a Poisson distribution. Um, and when I say Poisson distribution, that refers to um, the expected count of y for any value is ey. So I'm going to I'm going to write it out for eh, no, it's fine. So ey is equal to mu ey, which is equal to mu. So um, and when I say ey, I mean the expected of y. So the expected of y is equal to the mu of the expected y which is equal to mu. Okay. Hopefully that all made sense. You know what? Just for 
the fun of it in case you had no idea what I was talking about. That you is mu, in case you didn't know. Oops. Okay. So your EY is equal to mu EY, which is equal to U. And that's what I mean by your Poisson distribution. All right, so enough of me jipper jabbering. Let's actually make a model so I can start to see how this works. All right, so we're going to um, create a model, but we're going to start with fitting an intercept only model. So we're going to do this by using the uh, GLM or generalized linear model function. And one thing to keep in mind that's really important is in order to tell R that you're using a Poisson distribution or to specify for that, you have to use this coding. So family equals Poisson and link equals log. Bring this up here. It's a little easier to see. Okay, so this model um, implies that the expected number of satellites per each crab is the same. And you can get that from these fitted values here. So um, in this case, ESA is equal to this value here, which is seen in all of all the way across 2.919. Now that value is also um, equal to um, exp of your estimate standard of the intercept. And when I say exp, I mean um, your x. This term here. So that refers to um, your exponential term. So if I say x, if I say exp, or if I say exponential, I mean this here. So again, ES, ESA is equal to this value here in our model fitted, 2.91, and that is equal to the exp of your y intercept which we gain from the estimate standard. So the estimate standard of the y-intercept is this value here, 1.07. Okay. So that's how you get the general gist of interpretations. So now we can move on to more fun. So let's actually make a real nice Poisson regression. And we're going to do this of um, SA and width. So let's see if width of female's back can actually explain the number of satellites that are attached. So like I said, we're going to fit a Poisson regression model. And I want only one predictor because I'm only interested in width. And I'm going to do this using the generalized linear model function, or GLM. Remember, family equals Poisson link equals log. So we can run that model. Okay, so you run the summary, you get this output. Whee! Great! Now what? Well, you have to actually interpret it. So interpretation of parameters can get a little tricky for for some people. So I'll give you a refresher. There are two main things that you need to remember. First is that the x or exponential of alpha is equal to the effect of the mean of y, that is mu, when x is equal to zero. And x of beta, which is slope, beta is slope, um, is essentially with every unit increase in x, or it means that with every unit increase in x, the predictor variable has this multiplicative effect of x beta on the mean of y 
that is mu. So if you have a beta that's equal to zero, then your x beta is equal to one. And so your um, expected count equals x alpha. And that means y and x are not related. Because remember, x alpha is equal to the effect of the mean of y, that is mu, when x is zero. So if you say that beta is equal to zero, you're essentially saying your x is equal to zero. So at that point, x and y are not related. If your beta is greater than zero, then your x beta is greater than one, and the expected count is going to be x beta times larger than x equals zero. So your x of whatever the slope value is, is going to serve as the multiplicative value. And that value is going to have an effect on count that is larger, or is that number of times larger than when x is zero. If your beta is less than zero, then your x, x beta is less than one. So the expected count is x beta times smaller than when x is equal to zero. So if you have, an, essentially if you have a negative slope, um, because that's gonna be less than zero, then that multiplicative effect is going to, that's gonna have that number of times smaller um, of an effect on your estimated count than when your x is equal to zero, if that makes sense. All right, so with keeping all of that jibber jabber in mind, you can figure out um, how to actually read the output and read it well. So first thing you can do is figure out what the actual esti estimated model is. So when you, using this, we're gonna create, or how we would map out the estimated model is along the same lines as a linear model. So they use kind of the same function, y equals ax plus b, or y equals a plus bx, whatever you're using as your slope uh, variable. So our estimated model here would be negative, um, sorry, the log of mu to some exponent, exponential degree, is equal to negative 3.30476 um, plus 0 0.16405 W. So this value here essentially serves as our slope, and this serves as our y-intercept. Pretty easy, right? Okay, so moving on. The ASE, which is your approximate standard error, and that's looking at these two values here. Um, so your ASE of estimated standard, which is your slope, is this value here. Sorry, um, yeah, is this value here. So your slope is equal to 0 0.16405. So your estimated, your ASE for that estimated standard is 0 0.01997. So that number in general is pretty small, relatively speaking. Okay, so this here, these are your test, your T uh, statistics or your test statistics. Um, and then here are your p-values. So we're going to interpret the p-values um, under the notion of the 95% confidence interval. So the slope is statistically significant given its p-value, um, which is less than 0 0.05. So since the estimate of slope is greater than 0 or a positive number, we can interpret that there is a positive correlation between width and satellite number. So the wider the female crab, the greater the expected number of male satellites. And that's great, but what to what um, 
significance or what degree? Well, that's where your x of your slope or your beta factor comes into play. Remember, this is used to make your, um, your multiplicative value. So we're going to do that by running the exp, which is an actual function in R. So exp of your slope, which is 0 0.16405. So running that gives us this value here. 1.178 or 1.18. So what we can now say is uh, that the expected number of males satellites um, per female, so the wider the female crab, the greater the um, expected number of male satellites. And this occurs on a multiplicative order of 1.18 because that's the exp of your beta. So more specifically, for one unit increase in the width, the number of satellites, or SA, will increase, and it will do so on an order, or a multiplicative order of 1.18. That's all she wrote for that. All right, so you can also um, get the predicted count for each observation um, and their linear predictor variables and, um, from an output, output. And you can do this by using specific statements to get the predicted count for each observation. So that's what I'm going to do here. Um, basically, the predicted count is equal to the model fitted. Print that out. And I'm going to run both of these. I'm going to end up doing some jumping around so bear with me all right so scrolling up right now i want you to focus on the x model um dollar sign linear dot predictors so i want you to look at that output so for our first observation e y or e y one is equal to three point eight one zero. Okay, so that's great, but where is that number really coming from? How, how did we obtain it? Well, note the linear predictor variables. So let's scroll up. Okay, so here we can observe the predicted counts and the values of the linear predictor. And that this value is the log of the expected counts. So for the first observation, um, your predictor value was uh, three point, um, sorry, your predicted count was 3.810. And then when you look up here at the linear predictors for the first observation, um, the linear predictor is 1.3377. So the log of your uh, predicted count is equal to linear dot predictors. So under that notion, the log of oops, the log of this value, 3.810, is equal to our linear predicted value of the first observation, 1.3377. Um, now this is also um, the same, or you can explain it in another way, as the exp of your linear predictors is equal to predictor, or predicted count. So based on that, the exp of this value here, your exp of 1.3377, is equal to this value here, 3.810. So that's how that value was formed. You're, you're taking the exp of your um, linear predictor. So I hope that helps. I wrote it out here previously so that if um, you request to use this script, you have that um, kind of to 
help you out a bit. It's, it's easy to forget things. So, um, remember how just a few minutes ago we found that there was this significant positive slope. Um, and for one unit increase in width, the number of satellites increased, and they did so um, by 1.18. Well, it turns out that that is true for um, all of the values, and that's just the case for this, this set. And the reason I say that is because of this. So um, here I was interested in looking at the values for just a width of 26 and a width of 25. And by coding for that, you can pull up individual um, individual multiplicative factors. And looking at the results or the outputs, you can see that, so these are all the instances for the, the index number for um, when you had a width that was either 26 or a width that was 25. And the uh, multiplicative factor for each is 1.18. So the reason why I'm showing you this is because there will be instances where you have these pre um, these pre hypothesized um, ideas or pre hypothesized values that you want to look at in particular. You don't want to maybe you don't want to look at the full data set, especially if you have thousands of different var um, values in there, and maybe there's just one, two, or three that you want to look at in particular. Well, this, by using this coding here, stuff here, by using that format, you can code for a specific, uh, a specific value for a predictor that you are interested in looking at. And this saves a lot of time from, that might be otherwise spent sifting through tons of data, which if you're anything like me, any extra second you can get in the day is worth a lifetime. Okay. So let me run this real quick. All right, so what we're gonna do now is see how this model actually fits. And we're gonna do this by using, I'm gonna run that again, just so you can see it. We're gonna use this um, outputs from the summary of our model. So we're gonna do this two ways to start. So like I said, pull up your, the summary of the model. And we're gonna use this to quote unquote assess goodness of fit. Um, and this goodness of fit is based on the values that are yielded, um, sorry, the value that's yielded by dividing the residual, uh, what is it? Yeah, the residual deviance statistic by the degrees of freedom. All right, so here our residual deviance is 567.88 and that's on 171 degrees of freedom. So I put the actual equation for you here so you can have reference to what I'm saying. Um, but to assess goodness of fit, what you're going to do is you're going to um, take the residual deviance statistic divided by the degrees of freedom. So 567.88 divided by 171, which is equal to 3.321. Okay, so we get that value, great. Now what? Well, if you get a value that is greater than one, it means you have a poor model or your model doesn't fit so well. So based on that goodness of fit test, we don't have a very good fitting model. Um, there's another way you can do this. Um, the way I like doing it is the Pearson's chi-square analysis. Um, and that's to compare deviance to residuals. So to do that, you're going to use the P chi SQ function. And you're going to have your model and the deviance for that model plotted against the residuals and the degrees of the uh, degrees of freedom. Um, to get 
get your goodness of fit. So we're going to run that. All right, so our output is zero, which is very sad. That's our p-value. So we had a p-value of zero, which stinks. And in the previous um, analysis, we got a value of 3.321, which, as I said before, was greater than one. So both of these show the same finding. The model is not fitting well. Now, while that's very sad, there's logical reasons for why this may be occurring. Um, and having a lack of fit in a model is something that does occur. You, no matter what you do, it's, it's going to happen sometimes. So there's possible reasons for this. One is that um, you either have missing data that's contributing to the lack of fit, or you might have some um, covariates or a uh, term that's often used uh, over dispersion. And that comes into play a lot. And that's what we're going to actually investigate right now. So first, we're going to make, before we get into the nitty gritties, I want to show you something to kind of get an idea of how to look at your data is using the scatter plot, and that's in the plot function. So we're going to plot um, the satellites versus width. And then we're going to use this really cool thing called identify. So this allows you to click on a specific point and identify it, which is really fun to do. And mine wasn't working before and it probably still isn't. Yeah, yeah, I know I already identified that before. Okay, so see, it gives you um, what actual value that was or observation that was. So then you can go back in your data and see what the, the values were for the width or for the um, essay. So you can actually see what data points these are relating to. So huge thing to remember, I always forget this, is in order to basically tell our, okay, I'm done looking at this plot. I got all the information I needed. I did all the identifications that I wanted. You have to press the escape key. Only then will you get your your happy little carrot and you can move on with your life. Otherwise, it's just is horrible. Especially if you forget to the whole purpose of the escape key or stuck in R for hours restarting the program and nothing is happening until you press the escape key. All right, so the fun is over. Um, so we have to do some diagnostic measures now, the dreaded diagnostic. So we have to analyze the residuals and there are different um, methods that you can employ to analyze your residuals. Uh, for example, you can do deviance or adjusted residuals. I'm going to stick with the Pearson sky, uh, chi-square, which you can also use for analyzing your residuals. Okay. So we're gonna run these. All right, so as I said before, something that appears often is this term over dispersion. And over dispersion um, means that the observed variance is larger than the assumed variance. And one of the primary reasons for over dispersion is heterogeneity, um, where the subjects within each covariate combination still differ greatly. So for example, in this case, um, even crabs with a similar width will have a different number of satellites. And that's something that will just occur. I mean, having a width of five inches is not going to mean you're going to have the same number of males for every single female who has that same width. It's just not going to happen. I mean, some of the males might have died or you move in a population. It's, it's just the nature of the environment. You have to account for stochasticity. Um, so there are uh, two ways to um, 
kind of solve for um, dispersion. I just want to make sure I'm not getting. Okay, I'm not good. Okay, so there's two ways that you can solve for over dispersion. One is to basically adjust your data, adjust the standard errors, and to see uh, uh, test statistics. And the second is to use something called a negative binomial regression, um, where the response is followed, is it assumed, sorry, to follow a negative binomial distribution. So that index D um, is referred to as the dispersion parameter. And if you have a greater heterogeneity in the Poisson, that means you're gonna have a larger value of D. So as D approaches zero, um, the variance of your y or your the variance of your response variable will approach mu. Um, and essentially the negative binomial and Poisson regression will have the same inference that's provided. So assuming that we don't have covariates and we want to um, just adjust for over dispersion, we're going to employ this here. So this allows us to look at the mean and variance for all of the different um, uh, variables at once. That's the, the joy of the T apply. It also makes things very, do a lot of data at once, which sometimes can get a little overwhelming. So we have that. Now we want to look at the dispersion parameter. Um, so you can do this in um, in our studio. You can also do it manually, but you have the tools to do it here, so why not? Um, when you're looking for the, or when you're going to actually solve for the dispersion variable, um, you need to specify that you're doing this new thing, family equals quasi Poisson. And um, we're only going to have one var uh, variable, again, with right here. And also make sure you have the link equals log. So we're going to run this model. OK. So uh, with this model, the random component does not have a Poisson distribution with equal mean and um, equal variance values in response variable. Um, and we saw that easily when I was blabbering about the um, T apply function, that you don't have equality here um, between the different values for each different SA or W. Um, so instead, the variance of the random component for your response, um, the number of satellites for each width, is roughly three times the size of the mean. So where the heck am I getting that? What, what, what am I saying? OK, well, the dispersion estimate is given. It's on the screen right now. It's this value right here. So this, because of the test I did, I did a Pearson chi-square. Our Pearson chi-square is equal to 3.1822, and that is your dispersion estimate. So that value, that's where I, that's where my, um, what my statement about the um, random, the variance of the random component being roughly three times the size of the mean, that's where that's coming from, this value here. Um, and that's, again, given by running this line of function, testing the actual dispersion of the model that you've created. OK. Um, so you can also fit um, a negative binomial regression to the model. So remember, I said there were like two ways you could do that. You could either adjust or do the negative binomial regression. So 
Um, for this, the when you run a, a negative binomial regression model in R, your dispersion parameter is this term called theta. Um, so there's uh, two different ways to do the negative binomial regression. Um, both require this package here, mass. So again, um, if you need a package, you go to the packages tab, install, type whatever the package name is, in this case mass, and install. Um, but if you already have it, then you can just run library mass, and that um, basically activates that, that package for you. All right, so the first way to run it is using um, your generalized linear uh, model function or GLM function. And see, here we are setting our dispersion parameter to 1. That's what it's kind of often set at, at least the cases that I've looked at. Um, all right, so we're going to run that at uh, dispersion parameter set at 1. And then we can pull up the summary. So that's the first one. That's the first way to do it. Or, um, I think you get the same similar outputs. Okay, so, or you can run um, something called a glm.nb, which is like a specialized generalized linear um, model. Um, and that function can be used to, to calculate it. And again, you're going to have your theta set at 1 and it's going to have this term here that um, init dot theta. So you can run that one instead. And that gives you um, an output where you have your p-values, your s statistics. So you can make your, um, <clears throat> your model from that and determine um, the goodness of fit. And then you can also get these values here. So the um, log likelihood value, um, which can come into play with certain questions. Um, and that's about it for, for this one. Um, I'm going to leave it here. And yeah, hope that helped.